Welcome everybody to Dead Talk Live, and today we have three very special guests. We have Harry Aspinwall, Daniel Byers, and Ryan Scurinch. Let's see, two writers, a director, and an actor, right? There we go. Okay, Harry is the... And a producer. And a producer. I, yes. You know, as a fellow producer, I, I should be ashamed of myself. I, you know, <laughs> that totally sucks. We have writers, directors, producers, and the main lead star with us of the movie Eradication, which is available right now on Tubi. It came out five days ago on July 15th. Uh, it's a great movie. We're going to sort of break it down, not give away any spoilers. So how are you guys doing today, first off? Everyone okay? Amazing. So happy to be here, John. Thank you so much for having us on. This is great. Oh, it is yeah, my pleasure. It. And so Thanks. let's get right to it. Harry, you have a broad career in acting. You have some writing credits, but what really led you and Daniel to co-writing this script. Oh man, Daniel and I have been working on films together for so long since we were just shooting weird little uh, apocalyptic videos back in college in random abandoned buildings and, and stretches of wasteland. So this is something that's been a long time coming, more than a decade, I think. We've been making all these weird little shorts um, and sort of fantasy and horror stuff. And it was, I think the real catalyst was 2020 lockdown pandemic. Mm -hmm. We've been thinking for so long, oh, one day we'll get around to finally getting off our butts and making a feature. And we were like, well, if not now, then when are we going to do it? We have nothing but time. We were talking back and forth every day, coming up with a script and idea for like, what can we shoot kind of like safely and isolated and thinking about all the resources we had. Uh, but we just have such a long working relationship together that now it kind of all fell together. Daniel, in your time in the past working with Harry, has it always been you guys co-wrote together and you, Daniel, would always be the director, Harry would be the star? Is that how you guys always work together? I think we always collaborate pretty closely in a lot of different ways. So that's that goes from the story in some form, whether we're both writing it or whether we're sort of workshopping it together, uh, right up until the moment when uh, I get to throw Harry off of a mountain or into a lake <laughs> or off a waterfall or just, just really coming up with a lot of creative ways to nearly kill uh, one of my Here best I friends. Am. So uh, I appreciate <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the proof right in front of you. We didn't we didn't murder him in this, although we oh, came yeah. here times. He did all his own stunts. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. He carried 95 plus percent of the film all on his own. You did a fantastic job, by the way. Uh, Thank you so much. Ryan, okay, you know, the producers, the people who really make the movies, okay? Not the directors, not the actors, it's the producers, all right? <laughs> so, Ryan, uh, being the, produ the producer on this film, uh, tell us how and when did Tubi come along? When did Tubi come into the picture? Was it beforehand? Was it afterwards? Tell us about that. Yeah, we got Tubi came into the picture after we had finished uh, um, everything on the film. Uh, we brought on Jack Rabbit, who's our sales rep for the project. And uh, they connected us with Tubi, and uh, we've been very happy with them. So that was, uh, we waited until our film was completely finished. We didn't want to share anything to tarnish the viewing chance of the movie. So and getting a movie the final VFX. And getting <laughs> a movie picked up by, you know, an acquisitions department in a studio, it's not an easy thing. So, I mean, congratulations on that right off the bat. And Tubi is a, is a great place. Uh, so I assume all three of you guys are happy uh, and we're ecstatic, in fact, that the movie did land on Tubi and it would be available to such a wide audience because Tubi is AVOD. It's advertising supported. Uh, it's free. A lot of these major networks mm -hmm. are exploring now uh, yeah. advertising video on demand. There's a much bigger call for it. And Tubi, to their credit, has been out in front of it this entire time. So Ryan, are you yeah. like, are, are you happy that it ended up in finding a great home on Tubi? Oh, very much. And, and it being a Tubi original, I think is is a great asset for the film. Uh, and for yeah. an AVOD sort of platform, one thing I really do like about 
to be as well as the placement of the ads were very well positioned. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like on a YouTube where it's in the middle of a scene, it breaks into an ad. It felt very organic, almost like we made it around them, but we didn't because we, <laughs> we sold it to Tubi. And one thing about these AVOD platforms that I got to point out as well, the, the ads are nowhere near as long as regular oh. television commercials. We're talking at least half the time, the longest maybe 90 seconds. And it just goes by like that. Oh, they were great. Gave us a chance to cook more popcorn when we did viewing parties. <laughs> <laughs> now, Dan, yeah, I loved that. this film is about an apocalyptic viral pandemic. Uh, when you and Harry sat down to write the screenplay, what did you want to add that would separate it from the rest of the herd uh, of similar type movies and shows? Well, it's funny you say that because at the time that we wrote it and made it, there wasn't a herd yet. You know, we wrote this right in March when things were kicking off and we shot it in June of 2020. So it really was the absolute thick of things. And a lot of the things that uh, we came up with that sort of Harry found in his research and put into the script, like the at home tests, for example, those didn't exist yet. So a lot of that felt like uh, we were we were creating something and now everyone's like oh yeah at home tests we've we've had those yeah. forever. So a, lo a lot of this like prognostic stuff uh at the time we had to kind of invent uh it was also you know before any safety precautions were in place before mm -hmm. there were really any parameters for making a film safely during uh the pandemic yeah. and so we had to come up with all of our own safety measures on set as well just kind of based on the very limited science that we had at the time uh so that no one got sick you know we basically bubbled and quarantined the entire uh cast and crew which was pretty small so mm -hmm. it was not not as hard as it would have been if it had been a, a full size one, but oh, because yeah. we were micro budget, we had a small casting group. We just got them all up in that house. We lived where we shot and we uh, stayed there basically one straight month to make the film. That's awesome. Harry, uh, as the screenplay was being written, was it always known that you would play David? Uh, was that always a fact or was there some discussion about it? I think we, we kind of settled on that pretty early on. Um, mostly if anything for practical reasons it would mean having one fewer uh, person on set mm -hmm. and you know it's a way that Daniel and I have collaborated a lot in the past to being kind of both behind and in front of camera so I, I'd say there were both kind of practical reasons for it and we just knew that creatively it worked well. okay now Ryan you are a veteran producer especially for horror movies how did you yes. get hooked up with uh, Daniel and Harry first off? So uh, interesting story. I actually came on a little bit later in the game. Uh, I worked with Harry on another project that him and I were doing in the midst of the quarantine. And um, he shared uh, some early footage of what they were working on. And um, that's when I, I was like, this is fantastic. What, you, you and, what Daniel and you were able to pull off is great. So I came on um, and we did uh, pretty big reach uh, additional photography to add in some new sequences and then uh, connected them with a bunch of my post houses I know out here in Los Angeles so mm -hmm. we can get it across the finish line. That's great. And interestingly, it came out, correct me if I'm wrong, Daniel, what, exactly two years after we shot, after you guys did the first... Uh, first... Yeah, almost almost to the day. Yeah, he yeah. said yeah. They, they, you guys yeah, started like filming two, in June of 2020. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it came out <laughs> July 15th. Christmas. Ryan, besides COVID and the challenges that faced, uh, was there anything that was especially challenging for this film besides COVID? Anything else that, you know, presented a challenge for you as a producer? Well, limited budget, but uh, <laughs> I mean, that was certainly something. Um, it was pretty, I mean, honestly, when I came on, they had so much already accomplished. Um, from a production standpoint, things were not as difficult as they had to be. I think the harder element was getting uh, a lot of the vi visual effects put in, a lot of the color, a lot of the things uh, on the post side to a acceptable element on our tight budget. Okay. And so I was working a lot of our relationships to get to get that across the finish line, like I said. Well, like I always say, tight bu budgets always breed innovation. You always find a way to make it work. And That's uh, true. And, and I think all maybe all three of us, I think uh, played the uh, character that was uh, in the hazmat suit just for, for ease. <laughs> Why not? Yeah. 
Yeah, one, just one, one last person yeah, to yeah. hire. You know? yeah. Now, Harry, <laughs> uh, as the film unfolds, we see a very compelling sequence where David is having hallucinations and he sees uh, Sam. Uh, and he knows that it's a hallucination. He knows that she's not there. But his subconscious reveals some things about himself. He thinks of himself as sort of a non-leader, coward, always does what he's told. Is that how you interpret David? Uh, it changes as the movie unfolds, but would you call David a coward? I think that's a, that's a great question. And something that is at the heart of screenwriting is identifying the flaws about a character, especially how they see themselves. So I love that scene because we shot so much that was really chopped up and it was hard to, to you know, keep mm -hmm. mental track of until we edited it together. But that was something that Daniel actually added relatively late into the script. And it's this beautiful, like kind of meaty, single take uh, dialogue interaction scene that adds so much. Um, so, I mean, to answer your question, that is clearly a, a turning point for David, yeah. in my opinion. He's at his kind of lowest point and he snaps and he knows something has to change. Here's all the worst stuff about myself. What am I gonna do to change it? And he heads off in this, not necessarily logical, but certainly manic and energetic directions. I'm really glad you, you landed on that scene. Oh yeah, and he takes all, he starts taking some risks after that point. Now, uh, yeah. Daniel, the even though it's not directly told to us through some clues in the film, it looks like this movie takes place uh, at like the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains in Georgia. So I assume you guys shot this in Georgia, it being such a hot spot for filming anyways, or did you, am I completely wrong here? I'd love to shoot in Georgia. Uh, I'm from West Virginia myself, so, you know, the South is in my bones, but you no, know, we shot this way up North. We shot this in the Adirondacks, uh, wow. Lake Placid, New York, uh, in, uh, in a family house. And uh, that's also a place that's really special to me. The weather and the nature up there is like no other place I've been on earth. It's a swamp ecosystem, but also a mountain ecosystem mm -hmm. all at once. So you get these beautiful, strange mists that just pour in over the mountains. And one of the ways that we knew that we could get a lot of mileage out of our small budget was to go out and just really utilize nature. That was yeah. the one thing that we had a lot of. And one thing to answer your previous question that I think set us apart from maybe some of the other quar horror that was going on. There was a lot of stuff being done using Zoom and we have some elements of using technology to communicate at distance in this as well. That's an important part of sort of showing a relationship when two people can't be together. But we also wanted to get out there into the mountains. And there yeah. were some days when Harry and I would hike with you know all of our equipment, cameras, tripods, everything through the rain for miles up to the top of mountains mm -hmm. to get some of these shots, some of these big landscape vistas, just the two of us. And uh, I, I think it really paid off. They're my, oh, some yeah. of my favorite shots in the movie. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, Daniel, uh, a lot of people are going to walk away from this film with one particular question. And it's a s simple but not so simple question. Why? Why are the people in charge doing what they're doing okay there's we're not giving that much away here but i think you know what i'm talking about uh why are they doing this what benefit does this serve was that done intentionally to let the audience sort of ponder it come up with their own conclusions as to why they're doing what they're doing i mean tell us about that that's a great question. And I don't want to give too much away. And I also want to hear Harry's take on this. But I think there was there was something in the air around that time. You know, there was there was this massive global catastrophe going on. And there was this real sense that things were not working at the top, mm -hmm. that we were not getting the type of response that was warranted, that basically the people in charge were not meeting the moment. And I think that fostered a lot of kind of a, a psychic ripple throughout the whole country where people yeah. started to have this 
this loss of trust and authority. Um, and we were feeling that too. And we were thinking, you know, this is this is a pandemic of a certain scale. What if there was one that was much worse? Mm -hmm. You know, one that was deadly worse, that was basically an apocalyptic event. Uh, what would the people in charge once that happened be left with? You know, could you trust them in that situation? And who are and the are people in charge? Right now? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We don't really know who is actually yeah. doing this. We don't know who's actually in charge. What's your take, Harry? Yeah, um, I mean, exactly what Daniel said. I like that you mentioned um, the, the, the issue, especially around that time, and where do we get our guidance from? Because it was at that time that, that people were saying, uh, don't wear masks, do wear masks, do this, the other thing. And it becomes, and like, even with the best of intentions, that becomes kind of a, a recipe for, for people not knowing how to behave and misunderstanding each other. So exactly as Daniel said, we, we kind of took a lot of what we were feeling, our own insecurity about, you know, society, interaction with other people, the future. And we, as we often do, we think, how can we make this the biggest possible version of itself? How can we take what we are experiencing and see it through to some kind of uh, a massively multiplied end version? How would people react? What would be the most drastic uh, solution that people desperately trying to stay in power could come up with? Yeah. And then what would that mean for all of us? Exactly. Uh, now, Ryan, like you said, you sort of came in halfway through this project. I want to talk to you because you did, you were not there during the writing process. You did sort of come in after it all yeah, yeah. initiated. Let's talk about the infected, okay? And how the infected are presented to us through Daniel's mm -hmm. and Harry's writing and Daniel's directing. That, in my opinion, is what separates this movie. That's the, the thing that really... Uh, makes it stick out. It makes it really different from any other pandemic apocalyptic films. It was done brilliantly, uh, sort of a mix of different things we have seen in the past, but thrown together. So tell yeah. me, you know, what are your thoughts on how Daniel and Harry uh, came up with the idea of the infected and how Daniel brought them to life as the, the, the director? Yeah. Well, first to answer uh, to your prior question, I think some of the questions that are asked at the end is a great thing to not have them answered. It kind of leaves you wanting more. Yeah. And from a producer standpoint, if we ever do make more, it, it leaves open a good door for that. Mm -hmm. um, but for the infected, I think one thing that I really liked is uh, Daniel and Harry kind of pull the the jaws element where you don't see a lot of the, the infected until closer to the middle and the end, mm -hmm. and it has a bigger impact. And the mythology surrounding them of you know what type of close comparable you could use you know whether it's what type of monster is most close to what they become when they're infected makes them a very unique sort of uh element and what sustains them and what can turn them has you know i'm trying to trying to be vague about it without yeah. giving away too much so it's kind of hard uh to pitch that but but the reveal about certain elements about them i think is what really differentiates them from traditional infected you see in these sort of zombie sort of movies yeah exactly uh so daniel and harry when you guys were coming up with the concept okay how are we what's what are these infected people going to look like what, what how are we going to present them uh would you guys click right away did you bounce a lot of ideas before you settled on what you settled uh daniel walk us through how how did you guys come up with the final version yeah, we talked a lot about the look and the feel uh, of these. What we really wanted to do was to create a new type of monster, something that was in the vampire and zombie genre, but not like something anyone had seen before. And my favorite thing about what we came up with ultimately, not to give too much away, was that there was a way for this creature to oscillate between being human and mm -hmm. not. And mm -hmm. that's something that I always love in movies that uh, that have monsters that undergo transformations, right? Yeah. And you come back from it, or is it a one-way street? And typically with, uh, with vampire and zombie movies, it's a one-way street. Uh, we wanted to kind of challenge that and create something new that, that allowed like some of those intense, weird emotions that come up when somebody yeah. love changes to be complicated even further. Now, yeah, it was really fun from a writing perspective because uh, you can 
you can see these stages of desperation in people. You're never, you're never completely lost, but where you find yourself on this, like this transformation going back and forth puts these characters into very strange conundrums. The, like Ryan was saying, the mechanics of how these monsters work just gave us this kind of endless possibilities to play with, more than we could really fit into one movie. Oh, we, yeah. we keep coming up with new ideas for how we can use these, these monsters to tell other kind of weird, horrible stories. So that was, that was an extremely rewarding process. The sequence towards the end between David and Sam uh, were very intense, okay? Because uh, the infected, you you felt for them because they were not like, you know, your typical zombie where they're dead and then they come back as a creature. They're still human. Uh, they you, you develop emotions for them and you sort of kind of see them going in and out of this disease, this virus or whatever. Was that intense for you, uh, Harry, shooting it? it I mean you had to go to a very deep place and that sequence i i too i'm trying to not hit on the spoiler landmines but there's this one sequence where you sort of openly give yourself uh knowing that you're putting your life at risk and more than likely yeah. that is going to be taken advantage of what kind of state of mind did you put yourself in to really hit that home with the audience? Oh, that's such a good question. There's something really intense about being on all these different sides of a film. There's a lot of stuff where I'm just an actor and it's that that is nice in its way because you can just do your job and think about one part of it and then go home. But there's something that is both very taxing and very rewarding about kind of being involved in a story like this from its germination, coming up with it and writing it with Daniel to actually kind of performing it. I mean, uh, for, for weeks and weeks and months, we were just so sunk into this world, but it was strange at times to kind of step out and be like, oh yeah, we do have a real world around us as well. So it was, it was a very intense psychological experience. I think, you know, the, the, the state of the world as well being as it was at that point with so many of us not having seen our families yeah. and not knowing when we were going to be able to see our families. Um, it, it added a lot of, of this kind of odd desperation for intimacy that, that, I mean, it was impossible, I think, for, for any of us not to feel. Exactly. Now, Ryan, we're pretty much out of time, but I want to ask you this final yeah. question. Uh, the end, the, the very ending of the film is very compelling uh, on, on how it ends. You said you guys, when you came in, you did some reshoots and, and so on. Uh, was the ending already decided by the time you came on board? Or did you have a, a voice and all three of you together collaborated on how you were going to close this film out? So the ending was there, they had shot that. We actually added some additional elements to it mm -hmm. that sort of built up the anticipation of what he's walking into. Um, and one of the biggest things for me when I came on was to try to, you know, since I do quite a few horror films, I've made a few, I really wanted to elevate, elevate more of the horror. So a lot of the additional photography was in shooting more items that could help elevate the horror just because that also helps sell more. Oh, yeah. I always think from a producer standpoint of trying to make money. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a lot of what we did end up doing was that, but the ending was pretty much uh, stayed intact. Uh, we elevated it, I think, with some of the additional photography, but that that decision was still there. I did not see that ending coming. I, I did. It's it, divisive. Yeah, it, it totally <laughs> surprised me. I want to thank you guys so much for coming on here and sharing the, the story. Guys, the movie is called Eradication. It's available right now on Tubi. It's for free. Go ahead and watch it. You will not be disappointed. This movie will have you engaged throughout the entire, what is it, 90 minutes or so. Mm -hmm. uh, you won't be disappointed. Trust me, these guys did a fabulous job putting this movie together. I hope you got to hear a little bit of just some of the stories that went in behind it. We would have liked to have talked more, but then we would be giving away spoilers. So I want to <laughs> thank Ryan, Harry, and Daniel. Check out Eradication, available now on Tubi. 
you guys have any final thoughts you want to share before we go? I don't think so. And one of the other things I love about it being on Tubi is I can tell all my friends and family to watch it free. You don't exactly. have to say anything to watch my movie. <laughs> <laughs> so you should watch it too. Yeah, you, you don't have that awkward moment, you know, where you're telling somebody that you <laughs> yeah. know they're going to have to pay for it. I think that makes it great as well. Yeah. Thank you guys <laughs> again. Congratulations. Thank you very much, John. John. This film Thank is going to do John. amazingly well. I have no doubt about it. Thank you to our audience, those who are tuning in live. And those who will be watching this later on, on behalf of me and my guests, stay safe and stay walking. Bye, everybody. Bye.